the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires know, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare for the Paschal Feast, continuing in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers, let us make ready our hearts to renew the covenant of our baptism. Let us kneel before our Creator and Redeemer. Let us ask God to bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and to disclose to us the secret purposes of our hearts. And most especially, let us remember the covenant of our baptism and test our hearts and conscience to know how faithfully we have striven to safeguard the integrity of God's creation, respecting, sustaining, and renewing the life of the earth. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Most merciful God, by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you created humanity anew. May the power of his victorious cross transform those who turn in faith to him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach a neighbor to know the Lord because all will know me from the least 
to the greatest. I will forgive their sins, and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you, you look for truth deep within me and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin and I shall be pure. Wash me and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Create Make in me a me clean, a clean heart, heart, O God. O God. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. In the same way, Christ did not take upon himself the honor of being a high priest. Instead, God said to him, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. He also said in another place, you will be a priest forever in the priestly order of Malchi's edict. In his life on earth, Jesus made his prayers and requests with loud cries and tears to God, who could save him from death. Because he was humble and devoted, God heard him. But even though he was God's son, he learned through his sufferings to be obedient. When he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. And God declared him to be the high priest in the priestly order of Melchizedek, Edict, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Show your mercy unto me. In your compassion, cleanse my sin. Lord, show your mercy unto me. In your compassion, cleanse my sin. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities.
Cast me not away from your presence or withhold your spirit from me. Or withhold your spirit from me. Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip, he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain, unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it, and those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me, so that my servant will be with me where I am. And my Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me? But that is why I came, so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven, I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, it was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. The Gospel of Christ. A couple of nights ago, I watched a TV documentary on Pablo Picasso's great masterpiece, Guernica. That huge and terrifying painting was created by Picasso in response to an atrocity in the Spanish Civil War when German and Italian aircraft obliterated a small town in northern Spain. And that painting with its dead babies and disemboweled livestock and burning buildings is a perfect image for the journey we begin today for our next two weeks together in the Christian calendar for what we are going to move through and face together because for the next 
two weeks, we're taking a journey into hell. And it's going to end with us watching an innocent man slowly being killed. Throughout history, humanity has been swept on a tsunami of cruelty and violence across a vast and bottomless ocean of innocent blood. And in the face of that abominable suffering, the only possible divine response is for God to open his own veins and to match that flow of innocent blood with his own drop for drop. until at last we come to understand that the depth of divine love is greater than the wells of human hatred. We've come to the beginning of the most solemn time in the Christian year. We've come to the beginning of the most demanding and difficult two weeks of our life together. In the old calendar, today used to be called Passion Sunday. Passion means suffering. And it was the beginning of the two-week period called Passion Tide, which takes us to the cross. It's the church's deepest period of mourning. We mourn for the death of our Savior and we mourn for our sins, which brought him to the cross. Our passages from the Hebrew scriptures today invite us to reflect on the depth and pervasiveness of sin in our lives, but also to reflect on the power of the divine mercy which rescues us from that sin, that otherwise inescapable sin. And the psalm which we heard both in recitation and then meditated on with the choir, the psalm strikes the perfect balance between sin and grace. I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner, from my mother's womb. Give me the joy of your saving help again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Sin is everywhere, says the psalmist. It's hardwired into us from before our birth. But there is a cure. If sin is the illness, Jesus is the medicine. Both of today's New Testament readings present Jesus as the sacrifice who saves us from sin by his obedient offering of himself. And in the gospel reading, Jesus reflects at length on this sacrifice of himself that brings abundant life for all. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Jesus is using the analogy of a planted seed to help us understand his death and why he must go to his death. In the same way that a seed is buried in the ground and then becomes a new plant, new life, the body of Jesus, when it is buried in the ground, will spring up and become a source of new life. And so 
powerful and wonderful and amazing is that transformation that it can only be a source of new life for all people. The death and resurrection of Jesus is about the transformation of the world. It's about the creation of a new humanity. It is the first day of the new creation. Life that is freely given for others is a source of abundant new life for all. Life that is freely given for others is a source of abundant new life for all. And that's the meaning of the strange and disturbing teaching in today's reading to hate our own lives. You have to hate your life. Unless you hate your life, you're not going anywhere, says Jesus. Those who love their own life will lose it. Loving your life is a dead end. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. So what does it mean to love and hate our life? But to love our life means to cling to it at all costs. Hold ourselves close, close. Protect ourselves. Look out for number one. To love our life means to insist upon our rights and privileges. Loving our life means putting our own needs first paying less attention to the needs of others. You see, when we love our life, what we're really doing is assuming that life is a zero-sum game. There's only so much of it to go around, you know. It doesn't grow on trees. And if life is a zero-sum game, well, that means some people have to lose so that we can win. That turns life into a competition, a struggle. When we love our life, we are assuming that life is a competition. A competition for resources, a competition for status, a competition for happiness. Loving our life means assuming that there is only so much to go around. And if we are to have enough, well, that means some other people have to go without. Think, for example, how Canada has placed far more orders for COVID vaccine than we need. We've ordered, I don't know how many times more than we actually need to vaccinate the entire population of the country. Several times more. How come? I suppose playing it safe. Playing it safe is what it means to love your life. Hedging our bets and preparing for all eventualities Works for us, but it makes life more precarious for others. Loving our life, it was a description of our modern acquisitive consumer economy. Loving our life makes it all about us. Well, it's all about everyone. Hating our life, on the other hand, means following the example of Jesus. So if we hate our life, instead of focusing on what we need, we're going to pay less attention to our own individual needs and wants because we, we understand that in some sense, we all belong to each other. If we all belong to each other, we can afford to share. And if I give to you, 
Well, I'm not made poorer. We are both made richer. And that's the Christian understanding of sacrifice. It doesn't mean I lose so that you win. It means we all grow. We all gain. We all become richer. Hating our life means coming to realize that life is not a competition for scarce resources. Hating our life means coming to look at life in a very different way. It's not a life or death competition. It's a party. That's the best image I can think of for describing hating your life. It's we're, we're at a party. We're at a party where our gracious host has provided more than enough for everybody. So that's, th 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 this is the paradox of the gospel. When we hate our life, we get to go to a party. because we're not so focused on ourselves. Life is a party. Now, that doesn't mean that life is a nonstop good time. But think for a minute what it is about parties that makes them so wonderful. Why do we like going to parties? Reason number one, somebody else is paying for the booze. Reason number two, somebody else is providing the food. Reason number three, someone else is cleaning up afterwards. And all we have to do is show up. And the Bible word for all that is grace. Divine grace means that God has invited us to a party. And when we go to a party, we're all guests. Everything is a gift. And there is enough for everyone. And when you think about it, well, that pretty much sums up life. We're all guests. Everything is a gift. And there is enough for everyone. And when we get that, when, when we live as though we really believe that, well, John's gospel calls that eternal life. The other gospels call it the kingdom. And most of the time, you and I just call it a party. The church, the church does part. We are all about parties. The church does parties. And in particular, we have a very important party. Every Sunday, we act all this out. You know what that party is. We're doing it right now. It's called the Eucharist. The Eucharist is God's party. And at God's party, we get together, and every week, we retell the story of salvation. We tell it in word, and we tell it in action. We reenact this idea that God has placed us in a great cosmic party. And we make it real in our rituals. 
Now, right now, we all know this party isn't quite as much fun as it might be. Because we cannot all be physically here together in the same place. Thank God we have Zoom. Thank God we have modern communications technology that helps us to be together in this way. To keep reminding ourselves week after week that we are part of God's party. And even though our party feels diminished because we don't get to be together and we don't get to share in the sacrament. It's important to remember that the point of the Eucharist is not whether you or I personally get to eat the bread and drink the wine. That's actually not the point of it. The point of it is that we take part in this great drama week after week in which we act out salvation and in which we remind ourselves that sacrifice is the foundation of all life. So week after week, we make that sacrifice real again. Week after week, we represent that sacrifice. Week after week, in the great drama of the Eucharist, the sacrifice of Christ is made present again and again. Week after week on altars all around the world. In the great drama of the Eucharist, our church buildings become Calvary, where the blood of Christ is still being poured out for a suffering humanity. In the great drama of the Eucharist, we hear Christ still pleading his death for the sins of all humanity. In the great drama of the Eucharist, we see and taste the divine blood that still flows from the veins of God and will flow forever until we know the depth of divine love and see that it has drowned forever the wells of human hatred. In the great drama of the Eucharist, new life still flows from Christ's willing and obedient sacrifice of himself. Life is a party. And the life of the party is Christ crucified. Let us confess our faith as we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God made Christ a high priest for our salvation. As we pray, prepare for the Paschal Feast, let us earnestly offer prayers and supplications to God through his Son. I will pause after each petition so that you may add in your hearts or aloud your own petitions. For the one holy Catholic and apostolic church throughout the world and the bishops, clergy and faithful in every place, especially John, our Bishop, Brent, Bishop of Northern Philippines, Justin and Stephen, Province of the Church of England, Francis, Bishop of Rome, and the continuing Anglican Roman Catholic dialogue, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, especially our parish Lenten project and the work of all mothers and children count, that in faithful witness we may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those preparing for baptism and for their teachers and sponsors, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the leaders of the nations, especially Elizabeth, our queen, and those in authority under her, that a spirit of peace, respect, and reconciliation may grow among the nations and peoples. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, especially Susan, Valerie, Brad, Scott, Diane, and Duncan, and for all who suffer, for refugees, especially Tesfalum, prisoners, and all in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our neighbors, especially the community of Collingwood Elementary School, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have, Lord, mercy. have mercy. Blessed are you, God of eternal life who lifted up your son from death. Receive the prayers we offer you this day for all who walk in darkness and make your people children of light. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace be with you, sir. Peace be with you, Rita. Peace be with you, Mary. Peace be with you, Mike. Anyone who serves me must follow me, says the Lord, and where I am. There shall my servant be also.
Amen. And also with you. We lift them to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, 
that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us, O oh Lord, to be sinful from all evils past, present, and to come. And at the intercession of the blessed and glorious ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God. We break this bread, communion in Christ's body once broken. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. If we have died with him, we shall live with him. If we hold firm, we shall reign with him. The gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Let us pray. All your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. Gracious God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we who share his body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. While uh, the rest of the people who are making announcements are making their way to their virtual podium, you may sit down, Mary, and if, unless you want to stand. You want to stand? Go ahead and stand. <laughs> Uh, while everyone else is uh, making their way to their virtual podium, I will uh, make a couple of announcements. First of all, a happy announcement for those of you who are faithfully and laboriously moving through Lent, giving up something wonderful and lovely and good uh, and doing without it for 40 days. Well done. The great news is this week you get a break. You get a break because on Thursday, wonderful feast, a wonderful feast in, in, in our life as a church, the Feast of the Annunciation, uh, when the Virgin Mary learned that she would become the mother of our Lord uh, when, when she became pregnant, with, uh, pregnant by, the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, even in Lent, we have to turn this into one of our parties. So... On Thursday, there is no Lenten abstinence. Uh, fill your boots. Have a good time. Give thanks, uh, give thanks to God for Mary's faithfulness and for our redemption. Uh, and enjoy it. Secondly, uh, on a less joyful note, uh, I think we're all very excited a couple of weeks ago when the provincial health officer dropped a hint that uh, we might be able to, uh, well, a bit more than might, would be able to gather for in-person worship uh, for Easter. And ever since that announcement, we have been waiting for the other shoe to drop, which it has uh, stubbornly refused to do. Uh, and so uh, we are getting to a point where we really need to make a decision. And one of the, the, the big question uh, facing us really is if in-person worship were to be permitted over Easter, what would be the terms and conditions and protocols under which that could happen? And at the moment, we do not know that. We do not know what will be required of us to get ready to have worship in the church and so we have made the decision, or I have made the decision in consultation with the wardens, that through Holy Week and Easter, the church building will remain closed to public worship. And we will continue to have worship online uh, through, uh, through the next uh, few weeks. We are looking at a couple of uh, ways in which it might be possible to have some kind of uh, in-person presence in the church, uh, would not involve gathering in groups, uh, but uh, I'm going to be in touch with the Synod office tomorrow, and I hope I will be able to have more information to share with you next Sunday. But uh, the firm decision now is that the building will remain closed to public worship through Holy Week and Easter, and our worship will continue online. Now, are there more announcements? I see a head nodding. So, oh, here is Barbara. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you in the church. Okay. Thanks. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for attending our St. Patrick's Day celebration. 
Uh, it was a great turnout and a good time was had by all. And thanks, many thanks to the organizers of the event. Our outreach project this Lent is to raise funds for the PWRDF project. All mothers and children count in Rwanda, Mozambique, Tanzania and Burundi to help cope with the COVID epidemic by providing PPE, hand washing and hygiene support and, in, and instruction and access to reliable information about COVID-19. COVID the Government of Canada will contribute $6 for every $1 that we donate, so our donations will go a long way. You may include donations towards the outreach project along with the usual, along with your usual donation or separately. Either way, make sure to designate the donation as Lenten project. At this point, donations total over $6,200. And a huge thanks to all you parishioners for your wonderful and kind generosity. Cheryl received the following messages after notifying Christine Hills and Will Postma that we have so far raised over $6,200. Dear Cheryl, writes um, Will, that is wonderful and amazing news. Thank you so much and thanks to all who are supporting such an important program for PWRDF and our partners. And then another message from Carolyn Vanderlip director of the Canadian Anglican Partnership Program for PWRDF and our partners. Congratulations to everyone at St. Thomas, Vancouver, on surpassing your fundraising goal for PWRDF, All Mothers and Children Count COVID-19 Extension. Your generous gift of $6,200 will be matched six times by Global Affairs Canada and will make a tremendous difference to our partners, eHale in Mozambique, Partners in Health in Rwanda, Village Health Works in Burundi, and the Diocese of Maasai in Tanzania, as they work to ensure physical distancing, access to clean water, soap and disinfectant, acquisition of PPE, and dissemination of reliable health information. The funds will support frontline health work care workers <clears throat> who take great risks to work safely and protect the health of their patients. Please pass our gratitude to all of the members of St. Thomas in Vancouver. Thank you for all the work you do to support PWRDF. In gratitude, Carolyn Vanderlip. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Hello. Barbara. Jane. Um, I just wanted to say that um, also a great thanks for um, everybody that worked on St. Patrick's Day. And I wanted to make sure that everybody looked at the um, community announcements to see the creativity of all our parish parishioners in their limerick endeavors. Thank you. Although a little bird told me that at least one of the limericks was composed by somebody who had advanced warning. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, no one's, no one's going to answer that one. <laughs> well, I'll just say uh, my little announcement. Uh, though I didn't have it in the bulletin in time, we are going to have a choir meeting this coming Thursday. Thanks. 7.30, as usual. Thanks, Rita. Anything else? Don't think so. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you all. May you be transformed by God's grace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Go forth in the name of Christ.
Thank you. 